She is going to be speaking on new magnesium battery materials. Good afternoon, everyone. I know there's no coffee, so if I see anyone falling asleep out there, I'm going to come over and tap you on the shoulder. Um, well, the next um, talk is about a new battery material we have here at the lab for making magnesium batteries, hopefully a reality one day, um, and mainly for the use in electric vehicles and possibly even for grid storage. So why do we want to develop novel batteries for these applications? Well, because currently with electrical vehicles and their use of lithium ion batteries, you have limitations on both the drive, um, driving range and how much the vehicle costs. So um, for example, a battery pack on a Nissan LEAF has a range of about 138 miles on a, a single charge, and the battery comprises about $12,000 of the actual vehicle costs. So for us to all drive around in electric vehicles, we are going to have to address these two issues. And um, the market requires for us to be able to adopt uh, electric vehicles about a 30% lower cost point, and then also we have to increase our energy storage on batteries, especially if we're using the current lithium-ion batteries, to at least twice as much as we have today. So that's sort of the goal that the market sees to adopt electric vehicles. So what are people doing these days to try to bring this to reality? Well, researchers and entrepreneurs are exploring a variety of materials for battery um, anodes and cathodes, and they include things like lithium sulfur, which actually here at ORNL we have a group, um, Shangdu Liang, that's working on technology in this space. Um, zinc air, lithium aluminum, um, perons paranthemum, who spoke earlier today about um, making um, new uh, graphite materials, is also working with uh, lithium aluminum batteries, sodium metal halides, uh, lithium cobalt, and also magnesium. So this is kind of a, there's some materials in addition to these, but you can see all the effort in trying to come up with new types of um, metals and metal alloys for batteries. So magnesium batteries is what we're going to talk about today. And so what is, um, what I'm going to point out now is the promise of actually using magnesium for batteries. And I'll refer many times to comparing magnesium to lithium. So you can see with the current state today, how does magnesium differ? Well, the first step, um, point to make is that it's the eighth most abundant element in the Earth's crust. So clearly with a lot of material, which you can see here in the natural abundance, also, that means that the raw material is cheaper. So, for example, uh, magnesium is about $2,700 per ton compared to lithium, which is $64,000 per ton. Um, so that's one benefit. Another is that you have high energy density with greater specific cap capacity and two electron charge. So having higher energy density solves that problem right now with lithium batteries of not having enough energy storage. And you can see here, with magnesium, you get two electrons um, adopted with the magnesium versus one with the lithium, and the specific capacity of magnesium is 2,200 compared to pure lithium is 3,800, but batteries aren't pure lithium. They're always a combination of lithium with some either graphite or silicon um, anodes, and so they're close to bringing it down to more to 1,000. So it's somewhere in this range, depending on what type of battery you have. Another advantage of magnesium is it has a vo high volumetric capacity, so you can see here um, right here, that the magnesium um, is higher, so then you get more battery power in a smaller um, amount of, or a smaller space, which again is a benefit for electric vehicles. It's safer, there's no dendrite formation with an SEI layer that you see with lithium, and also magnesium itself is non-toxic and environmentally stable, so it's a green technology compared to lithium. So commercial development of magnesium batteries, what's going on today? So I've listed a couple examples, but initially the idea of magnesium battery came back in 2000 in a university in Israel, and from there there's a lot of work going on um, in, across the world, including even NREL is um, working in magnesium batteries along with ourselves. And um, for com companies, Paleon is a, um, 
uh, another startup out of, or a startup working in this space, it's a spin out from MIT, is really focused on developing the cathode. And I'll go into what a battery consists of, but a cathode is one of the components or materials needed for a battery. And they've identified suitable cathodes um, to work with magnesium. Another effort is led by Toyota. Um, it's also working on cathode. Um, it estimates that a magnesium battery probably won't be debuted until at least 2020. Um, and it's working with national labs and user facilities to be able to analyze magnesium batteries to develop good cathodes. And now they realize that those cathodes and the magnesium anode does not work with conventional lithium electrolytes. So they're also focused on developing new electrolytes. And that's where we take our story here at ORNL. So ORNL is also in the space working on electrolytes because that's also a key to making uh, magnesium batteries work. To have an electrolyte that will work with the magnesium, not produce a passive layer over it, and inhibit the magnesium for doing the electrochemistry. So at ORNL, if you look at a battery, we have, in, in our example, a magnesium metal. And then you would have a cathode. And I mentioned that people are working on cathodes, but one of the common cathodes that are used with magnesium is um, called a chev uh, I have it on the next slide. I think it's Chevlon um, uh, cathode, a molybdenum sulfur um, magnesium uh, cathode. And with these two anode and cathode, you need to have an uh, um, electrolyte that can carry the magnesium from one side to the other and release an electron. So when you have the magnesium metal, you can then um, put it into solution and release two electrons, and that's how you get the battery to discharge. So these are the um, electrolytes that we've developed here at the lab to allow this magnesium to be active, not to be passive, and um, to actually do this electrochemistry. And this is the cathode I had mentioned, Chevrel, um, is who developed this. This is commonly used um, with magnesium batteries, although, as I mentioned, there's a lot of work in this area. Um, electrolytes that are currently um, used, uh, for example, is this particular one by Aubach. They also were involved in, in the production of this cathode, the same group. The problem with this is that it um, ignites upon exposure to air, so that's not always what you want in a battery. Then Toyota has also come up with some other electrolytes. However, they're very hydroscopic. And so, you know, anything that's going to attract water into a battery is going to, you know, oxidize, reduce your, your metals. And so that's not going to be very efficient. So we've come up with a series of electrolytes based on ionic liquids. We have a very big portfolio here at the lab with ionic liquids. Um, and they have a variety of uses. And here's a class that's useful for batteries. Um, the work in ionic liquids here at the lab is led by the um, inventor, Dr. Shang Dai, and his group. So uh, what are advantages of ionic liquids in this, especially for the use of batteries, is that they're low cost. They um, have low cost of goods. The starting materials are readily available. And the chemistry itself is not very complex, and it's scalable. Um, the uh, ionic liquids are safe. They don't ignite in air. Um, they're air stable, and they allow a large electrochemical window. And this is very good to have a, elect, um, a potential that then could allow batteries to be used for grid storage and electric vehicles. And here's an example of one of the ionic liquids. You can see how it interacts with the magnesium to allow it to shuttle that electron um, during charge and discharge. And then here is some data that we have in coin cells that shows that uh, at um, 50 cycles of charge and discharge, it still maintains its efficiency and it's not degraded over cycling. So as I mentioned, the applications that we see for, for this type of battery is electric vehicles um, and then also the electric grid because especially of its energy density, you can see it has a wide um, voltage range here for the circuit voltage, but we feel that with these um, ionic liquids as electrolytes, you, it's been also shown at NREL that ionic liquids approach this um, higher level of the voltage at 2 volts. And you've seen lots of data on today on markets for electric vehicles and for um, the different aspects of the of battery components. So I'm not going to give details on that. I just am putting this graph up so you can see for the electrolyte, it's got a big piece of the pie. So reducing the cost um, for the electrolyte will indeed affect the cost of the battery. 
And this is the intellectual property that we have covering this. It also, in this particular patent application, we also include an anode material as well. So this group not only works on electrolytes, but also anode materials. And there's other groups at the lab that are working, as I mentioned, in other type of battery materials that we can um, discuss. Oh, I didn't realize that was in there. <laughs> and that concludes my talk. <laughs> Any questions? Is everyone still awake? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Where did, oh, yes. Okay. For the um, original magnesium battery patent, um, is the, does ORNL have um, some sort of uh, access to that or license to that patent? So if this were, if the, if the electrolyte solution sure. in the anode were available? Right, so for, for um, someone who's licensing the technology from us, um, well, I would anticipate that the group that would be licensing the um, IP probably would be making the electrolytes and then selling it to people manufacturing the batteries. As It could be that, or it could be someone who actually did um, obtain any intellectual property needed to actually make the whole magnesium battery. Um, but here at the lab, with the federal funding, um, we're practicing under the government use license for our technology. Yes. Um, oh, sure. Um, I don't know particularly that question because the mentor was unable to um, be here today. He had a um, previous engagement at UT, but I can ask him that specific question. Um, I know it is in a closed system, and I don't know if heat is produced that would cause that. Um, but the electrolyte itself is allowing everything to stay in solution and avoiding air. So I don't know if that addresses it or not.